Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Our broadcast this evening is brought to you by Nature Box, shipping great tasting and wholesome snacks right to your door. So forget the vending machine and snack smarter with wholesome, delicious treats like cinnamon spiced almonds. Support this show. Get your free Nature Box sampler box. Go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. Naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. We are doing a bonus podcast this week. We didn't do a show in the first week of the month. We were getting set for the big 200, the big 200th broadcast. Pretty much on the day of the 200th show, I started to get really sick. And I've been down with bronchitis for days and days, and I'm just now getting myself back into the game. And I feel compelled, even though we are a little bit late to the conversation, I feel compelled to do a broadcast which deals with the Charlie Hebdo tragedy. And we're going to do that on Thursday, 6 o'clock Central, in a show that's called In the Wake of Charlie Hebdo. And I'll be speaking to several people, including a satirist, an artist who knew personally the artists killed in Paris. Brian Dalton, Mr. Deity himself, posted a video commentary about the Pope's position on free speech. Now, the Pope came out and said, you cannot provoke. He essentially said, I protect free speech, I support free speech, but don't insult people or their faith. Well, Brian Dalton came out with the video almost immediately, and the video was called, Fuck the Pope. I invited him to join me for a few minutes and weigh in on Thursday night. I'll also have Ali Rizvi, the uh, Pakistani-Canadian writer, physician, and commentator. He uh, just wrote an article for the Huffington Post called How Terrorism Won. And then Faisal Saeed Al-Muttar of the Global Secular Humanist Movement is going to join us as well. We're going to talk about Charlie Hebdo, the tragedy. We're going to talk about Islam and how all of this relates to Islam, plus your calls and emails if you have an opinion, a question, anything you want to contribute for the show, the email address to do so is podcast at thethinkingatheist.com. I have been monitoring the YouTube page today. I just posted a video response to Pastor Stephen Kim of New York City, who just posted a blog a few weeks back giving Christian men guidelines for guys who are seeking a suitable wife. And, uh, So the blog goes up and it's 10 guidelines, things that you should look for or not look for in a woman. The gist of the article was avoid ambitious women, confident women, divorced or otherwise unsubmissive women because they were designed for the man. And uh, this stuff was taught in the Baptist church that I grew up in. So don't tell me it's fringe teaching and not mainstream Christianity. I know some of the more quote-unquote progressive churches have distanced themselves from this and even have female pastors. But I remember going to Eastwood Baptist Church as a young person. Pastor Bill Hogue, I still know his name. He said, from the pulpit, women should be silent in church. And of course, a host of male voices said, amen because you didn't really clap at this particular church unless it was a special occasion or something. Then there's a whole generation of people, believe it or not, male and female, who genuinely think women are essentially baby dispensers. They just pop children out like Pez, and men have divine authority over them. Well, the opportunity was just too good to pass up. And so I produced a short response video And you can find it on YouTube. If I think of it here, once the broadcast is over, I will go back and I will go ahead and link that video in case you want to watch it. 
And it was funny because I was sort of scrolling the comment section and a female went in and said this, this video excited me more than I care to admit. I'm a 10 out of 10, meaning she is 10 of the things that men, Christian men are supposed to avoid. And she says, in here, looking for a man, I want a man whom I can corrupt to the extent of eternal damnation, (laughs) who helplessly grins while giving his soul to Satan, me. I will do things to him that will test his faith like no other earthly experience. If you are a Christian of really strong faith, I am God's test for you. This is the flavor of comments that are coming out on the video. So I've been watching it with interest. What else is going on? Phil Zuckerman of the LA Times just posted an op-ed called How Secular Family Values Stand Up. And it takes on the myth that you have to be a God follower to be a moral person and to have a strong sense of family and purpose. In fact, from the article, these are the words of researcher Vern Bankston, who's a USC professor of gerontology and sociology, said this, high levels of family solidarity and emotional closeness between parents and non-religious youth and strong ethical standards and moral values that had been clearly articulated as they were imparted to the next generation. Many non-religious parents were more coherent and passionate about their ethical principles than some of the religious parents in our study. The vast majority appeared to live goal-filled lives characterized by moral direction and sense of life having a purpose. Anyway, Phil Zuckerman's a professor of sociology and secular studies, and he has a great blog. You can look it up at the LA Times online. Just look for how secular family values stack up. And then finally, I got to mention this. The kid who wrote the book or inspired the book that came out years ago that said he went to heaven. (laughs) <laughs> actually has just come forward and said, I made all that stuff up. I just look for attention. I thought it was awesome. His name is Alex Malarkey. And yes, his name is Malarkey. Just came out a few days ago and said that the story that inspired the book, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, story is all a bunch of crap. And I went on social media and I said this, look, the question is not, and by the way, the publisher is having to recall the book now, and it's a huge, just red-faced fiasco. I said, the question is not, why'd the kid make up the story? That's not the question here. The question is, why is a major publishing house selling as fact claims of a post-trauma adolescent who claims to have walked in another dimension? That's the question we should all be asking, and I suspect, highly suspect, outside of the sort of desire to believe, I suspect the answer is money. Anyway, Tyndall House is having to go yank all those books off the shelves and recall the printing completely after all these years. Go figure. We'll continue with my special guest here in just a second, but first, you know, life gets hectic. And when you get in a hurry, it's easy to say, just screw it, right? I'm hungry. Give me the candy bar. Give me the convenience store muffin. Yeah, the one that's got 600 calories, 25 grams of fat. Have you looked at the ingredients on those suckers? My friends over at Nature Box have a great alternative to the chips, the candy, the sugar, the bad decisions we make when life gets ahead of us. And their website offers literally hundreds of nutritionist-approved snack options Zero artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, zero grams, trans fats, zero high fructose corn syrup. I got a box in last week. We're doing the Greek yogurt pretzels, the French vanilla almond granola. We tried something new. It's called sea salt pop pops. They're kind of hard to describe. It's like a blend of popcorn and cornflakes. I mean, (laughs) I don't do it justice. You have to kind of try them. My stepdaughter is hooked on the Big Island pineapple. We've all got our favorites. There's something literally for everyone. A great way to support this show. Right now, you get a free trial featuring five of their most popular snacks. So check it out. Log on to their website at naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. That's naturebox.com slash thinking atheist and thanks for supporting the broadcast greatly appreciate it for 19 years 
Ryan Bell was a pastor, most recently senior pastor of the Hollywood Seventh-day Adventist Church. In March of 2013, he resigned due to what he called theological and practical differences. As an adjunct professor, he's taught subjects ranging from intercultural communication to bioethics. He's currently a researcher, writer, and speaker on the topic of religion and irreligion in America. In January of last year, almost exactly a year ago, he began a year-long journey that explored the limits of theism and the atheist landscape in the U.S., and he blogged about that experience on his blog at Pathos, Year Without God. He has a Master of Divinity degree from Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and a Doctor of Ministry in Missional Leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. He joins me on the radio tonight. Ryan Bell, thanks for being my guest, my friend. Oh, it's such a privilege to be here. Thanks for having me. You have probably been pawed at by quite a few people, right, after releasing this story about the blog, about all that stuff. Have your phone and email been going absolutely crazy? Yeah, absolutely crazy. I can't even keep up with it. In fact, I've even missed a few interviews, luckily not live interviews like this one. So, Well, let's talk about this and let's start at the beginning. You decide you're going to live as an atheist? Is that the idea? I'm I'm going to pretend I don't believe in God, or had you already sort of gone there and decided, let's see what happens? I mean, get me into your head in January of 2014. In January of 2014, I really didn't know anything about the atheist movement or community beyond a couple of famous authors. Um Seth Andrews. Wait, no, it wasn't. It wasn't Seth Andrews. Just stop. Just <laughs> stop. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I really didn't. I really didn't know what was out there waiting for me, and so I, I really, as you suggest, I had come to the edge. You know, sort of to the edge of the of the precipice, and and I, it, it's not as some have said that I had a strong Christian faith and just decided for the kicks. You know that I would just pretend not to believe anymore. Like I came to the edge of my belief and I didn't want to just discard it hastily. I wanted to see if I could keep it if I, if possible. And because it had served me in many good ways over the years. Um, but I had this suspicion that God was not there, that there was no God. And I really wanted to take a year and test that out and see both intellectually and experientially, where that path would lead me. Well, let's pinball back to your childhood, raised in a Christian household. Yeah, my folks were Methodist when I when I was born, um, and then by the time I was about five or six years old, they became Seventh Day Adventists. Um, and so, of course, I just went to church, my younger brother and I, with them, um, and grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church for all intents and purposes. We explore different denominations of Christianity on this show, but give me the Cliff Notes version. Seventh-day Adventists, what separates them from, say, the Methodist, the Lutheran, the Assembly of God, the Baptist? Well, the the Seventh-day Adventists were a mid-19th century phenomenon in northeastern United States. During the Second Great Awakening, there were a lot of revival movements, uh, millennial movements, which were uh, groups of Christians that believed that Jesus was returning to the earth personally to take the redeemed to heaven, you know, any minute now. And um, so the, they began as the Millerites, uh, named for uh, a, a farmer named William Miller, who read Bible prophecy and decided that Jesus was going to return to earth in October 22, 1844. Um, so, and then, so that day came, and spoiler alert, um, Jesus didn't come back, and uh, Adventists refer to that as the Great Disappointment. <laughs> very, um, not very euphemistic uh, kind of expression. So that led to a, a period of confusion, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church was born out of that confusion, and it was uh, also part of a restorationist movement, which meant, um, like other denominations, Churches of Christ, uh, Stone Campbell. Uh, movements were interested in recovering and restoring lost 
truths, as it were, from the Bible. So Seventh-day Adventists um, latched on to the Seventh-day Sabbath as sort of a teaching of the Old Testament that they claimed hadn't been changed by Jesus in the New Testament. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of the very few Protestant denominations that uh, goes to church and worships on the Jewish Sabbath. And the Adventist part of the name is this idea that Jesus is returning to the earth very soon. Is there skepticism because of the failed prediction from before? I mean, are people sort of like, ah, you know, he may, he may not, or do they really believe? Well, you know, this is, this is an interesting point. I mean, I think there are, there's a group that really believes. And what, what happened was uh, after 1844, the new theologians of that time were, they sort of moved the goalposts. They said, you know, the date we got right, but what was supposed to happen on that date uh, we got wrong. It was some uh, transition in the heavenly sanctuary that is what was happening on that day. Of course, nobody could verify or disverify that. It's just something that they claimed. And so people sort of latched on to this new idea. So I don't know if the skepticism just went underground, but it's getting harder and harder after 160 years or so uh, for people to say, Jesus is coming very soon, even when you think of soon in that biblical <laughs> sort of way. Ryan, if you're a product of a Christian home? Are you involved in the culture of the church? You guys going to Sunday morning church, Sunday evening? Are you participating in church activities? I mean, paint the picture for me. Growing up, you mean, and as a yes. child? Yeah, I mean, as your, yeah. your formative years, your youth, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Like we have um, in the Adventist church, we had um, a co-ed Boy Scouts kind of uh, club called Pathfinders, and I was involved in that as a kid usually one evening a week, camping trips, that kind of thing. Every summer, there was a big camp meeting, a kind of a Methodist camp meeting type thing that we would go to. My grandparents would go and uh, we would listen to speakers. There was youth retreats. I went to summer camp as a kid and up in the mountains outside of Hemet here in Southern California. And so I, I really was pretty immersed in that world. I was always a very spiritual kid as well. I, I sort of... I wanted to study the Bible. I wanted to understand these mysteries. And I spent a, a lot of time thinking about that, even as a teenager. And I guess that's probably what led me to think I was called to be a pastor. I just had this sensibility about it. I really wanted to know, to connect with this divine reality. I'll get to your apostasy here in just a second. Tell me about seminary. Are you honestly exploring the scriptures or are they training you to formulate sermons? Yeah, there was a little bit of both. I would say that the biblical studies uh, and the theology departments were, well, the biblical studies department was definitely more teaching us to study the Bible. I mean, it always had an eye to making sure we had the right interpretation. <laughs> so um, and the Adventist Church has, you know, very firmly declared that the historical critical method is off limits because that's a liberal way of reading the Bible. Uh, for those that don't know what that is, it's just basically uh, a way that theologians read the Bible in its historical context and treat it as they would treat any other historical text. Um, of course, conservatives really frown upon that because they say, that the Bible is divinely inspired and has to be treated differently. So even though we were studying the Bible, we were sort of forbidden from going down this historical critical path. And then when it came to the, you know, the practical classes about how to run a church and how to grow your church, it was all very much sort of, I, I call it vo vocational technical training for being a pastor. It's not really critical thinking. And it didn't even, in my case, include liberal theologians that I later read and studied myself. Uh, it was very much in the party line, um, teaching you to be an Adventist pastor. I said the word apostasy in regard to you. Is that an accurate word? Are you an apostate? I guess so. I mean, apostate, I guess, means someone who's turned their back on the on the group or on the on the tribe. And um, yeah, it, it feels like a harder word than what I personally feel. I, I feel like a reluctant apostate, I suppose. I feel like someone who would have preferred to discover that it's all true. Um, I liked being Christian leader. Um, I liked being uh, a person who helped other people pursue their spirituality and that kind of thing. Um, 
I had God in my mind, in my mind frame as a, a person, a being who helped make sense of the chaos of the world. It was a comforting idea, but not just a comforting idea, but an intellectual framework as well. So I suppose I am an apostate, um, but reluctantly so. I mean, I think I didn't, uh, like I said in one of my blog posts at the end of the year, I, I didn't do a, a victory lap uh, at the end of the year. I sort of said, well, I think this is probably the size of it. And uh, what do we do now? <laughs> I saw a recent article, I think it was on uh, Charisma, uh, that was titled, Why Are So Many Christians Turning Into Atheist? And your photograph was at the top of the article. Yeah. Does the word atheist make I, you uncomfortable, Ryan? No, not really. Um, it it doesn't. I think, I, and I'm used to having a carrying a label around that is uh, has multi multiple feelings associated with it. So when I was a Christian, there were plenty of people who thought Christian was a bad word, and I was sort of used to having to say, "Well, you know, here's what Christian means to me." And so I, I'm not afraid to say atheist. I think. As we've said many, many times, atheist just means that you don't believe in God. Um, it doesn't mean that you have proven that there's no God or that there's uh, any particular kind of empirical evidence of God's non-existence. I just, you know, for my effort, I have I've not been able to determine that there is a God. And the world just makes more sense to me when I hold on to this idea, when I sort of embrace this idea that, that there isn't a God. It's funny, I was... Referencing the article, the first paragraph is about you, and they almost immediately segue into the story of Tim Lambesis, the former vocalist for the quote unquote Christian metal band As I Lay Dying, the guy who attempted to assassinate his own wife. So they didn't yeah. take long going from Ryan Bell, former pastor, to attempted murderer Tim Lambesis. And it's just this weird sort of stretch to try to find evil associated with non-belief and you probably yeah. heard some of that right i mean come on this is the work of satan he's whispering in your ear this is a slippery slope right it, it, yeah i definitely have heard that and it's really dishonest i think to write an article like that and connect the two of us in that way it, it serves their audience you know and i understand why they do it but it's just not an honest way to do that i mean i've had people say to me Sort of tongue in cheek, but I, you know, maybe not so. Uh, why didn't you, why instead of a year without God, did you not do, um, you know, a year of being a serial murderer or a year of having a sex slave ring um, or, you know, like some, a year of being, uh, you know, cynical and rude? You know, it's just like, yeah. and I said to them, because I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to be those things at all. So why would I spend a year doing that? That doesn't make just doesn't make any sense. I'm going to get back to the fallout from your quote unquote announcement here that happened just a few weeks ago. But if I'm going to do an honest, objective interview, at least hopefully semi objective interview. I have to include <laughs> this question presented by one of our listeners, Helena. She said this. Sorry if this is blunt, but I wanted to get to the point. It's difficult to believe. As a lifelong atheist, that someone who devoutly believes in God could just decide to not believe for a whole year. I can't even get people to think from an atheist point of view on mundane topics like getting all green lights on the way to work without them thinking it's because God blessed them. Did you really just decide one day to walk the path of an atheist to see what would happen, then conveniently claim to lose your faith, or were you already an atheist beforehand and you just used the, quote, experiment as an easy way of getting out of religion? Helena, thanks for the message. Do you want to respond to that, Brian? Yeah, sure. I, 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 she makes a really good point, and I think we touched on this a minute ago as well. I was... Anybody who's been a believer who then is not anymore goes through some kind of process. Almost everyone I've talked to has a process. Most people do it quietly, you know, in their own time without writing a blog about it. Um, but I think that it's, I've, I've often referred to the Truman Show, you know. So if you've seen the Truman Show, you know, Truman's about 30 years old. And one day, like, one of the set lights falls from the sky and lands on the sidewalk in front of him. And he's, you know, he thinks to himself, well, that, that seems 
wrong? Like, <laughs> where did that come from? You know, so there's just these little things that start happening in your life and you begin to think, wait, this is not part of the story. Where, what's going on here? Why, is, why are these things not adding up? That had been going on for me for 10 plus years. Um, and when I started Year Without God, I really was, like I said, on the cusp of having lost my faith or maybe even saying I lost my faith. But because it had been such a meaningful thing to me for so many years, and I and it was not just a personal thing, it was a career, it was a lifestyle, it was everything. My whole life was wrapped up in it. I didn't just want to throw it over my shoulder and walk away. I don't even know if I would have been capable of doing that. I really needed to step into this new water and say, okay, what's the thinking process here? What are the arguments? What is the are atheists all nihilists? If not, how do they avoid being nihilists? Is there a, like you referred to Phil Zuckerman's piece a minute ago, is there a morality without God? And if so, how does that work? And, you know, all of these questions are questions I hadn't really explored. So I took the year to basically say, am I really an atheist or am I, am I just a uh, disillusioned Christian still? And so that was the process for me. Diving into the culture to try to see it in three dimensions, would that be an accurate yeah. way to say it? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, again, it wasn't just an intellectual experiment. I, I actually went to some conventions, met people, talked to them, interviewed them, heard their stories, compared notes. Um, yeah, so it was an insider view. And I think in order to really legitimately get an insider view, I needed to say, I think I'm an atheist. I'm not sure. I don't really feel comfortable calling myself an atheist right now, but I'm going to live this year with that assumption. Like, let's, my, my sense is perhaps there's no God, so let me live this year from that point of view, from saying, okay, there's no God. Um, what do I do now? So the skeptic looks and they say, well, you could have made this journey quietly. Why make a public announcement? Why the documentary film crew? Why make this such a big deal and so that all these eyes are sort of watching you? Right. Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And I can easily see now from where I'm sitting how my own skepticism would be sort of uh, ignited by seeing a story like this. Um, and I think the reason is that I, there's a number of things. I had always lived my life in public. I had always, uh, as one person said to me today, lived out loud, you know, and that was what I was trained to do as a pastor and as a, an evangelist. I was living my belief system out in public. Um, it's just the, the life I had chosen. And so for me to write a blog about, I mean, I've been a blogger for 10 years. For me to write a blog about this experience, it seemed like the most normal thing in the world. I didn't know that it was going to reach the kind of audience that it did. I thought, you know, there might be a hundred or 200 people that would eventually read the blog and we would have a nice chat from time to time and that would be it. But it didn't stay that way for whatever reason. I really don't know. And, yeah. I think I read about uh, you in the, what Washington post and some other national publications picked up your story. Amazing. Yeah. In January, by the 15th of January last year, CNN had me on Brooke Baldwin show and, um, I, I was, yeah, the, uh, the guy that wrote the CNN piece got syndicated around. And so, yeah, it was a big thing even in January of last year. Um, and people I think are rightly skeptical to say, is he playing us? Is he, is this just a stunt of some kind? Is he just trying to sell something? And, you know, and I took all that in stride the best I could because I, I could see, um, that that is possible. People might, you know, someone might choose to do that. Um, in my case, I just honestly was sort of searching for a new path. And um, I'm really grateful for the people who came alongside and said, well, if you, even if you end up as a Christian at the end of the year, I think it's really important to ask these questions. I mean, John Loftus in his, his book, The Outsider Test of Faith, talks about how, you know, he feels people of faith ought to uh, apply the same critique to their own religion that they would apply to any other religion. So it's that moment as a Christian when you think, man, these Scientologists are crazy. And then you, <laughs> and then you think, and then it dawns on you for the first time in your life, like, wow, like I have a, a crazy story too. You know, a virgin who's impregnated by a spirit from outer space that, you know, it's like you, if you just change a few of the, of the gr grammar of the grammar a little bit, it, it sounds just as crazy. It just isn't, 
it doesn't feel as crazy because I was raised to believe that. I'm talking here with former pastor Ryan Bell. Ten years of off and on questioning. This is probably exponential. It's ramping up. This must make sermon preparation rather difficult, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's definitely less material to preach from um, the further you go down this road. Um, I mean, I think the liberal Christian church provides uh, a lot of resources for that because there are plenty of uh, liberal clergy who don't think that the miracles are literal, that Jesus didn't really raise from the dead, um, things like that. But they continue to use these stories of Jesus and the Gospels and some of Paul's admonitions to encourage people to live good lives. So there are ways um, of preaching some of the, the moral and ethical uh, teachings in a way that, you know, I, what I always said to my congregation is that our, you know, our goal is to put our faith into action. So if we, um, you know, see suffering in our community, then, you know, our goal is not to just piously sit by and pray, but to get out there and alleviate the suffering as best we can. So you're doing variations on kind of a humanistic message. Let's go out, help other people, be compassionate, feed the hungry, make the world a better place. And then you tie it in sort of in an abstract way to Scripture? Sure. Or or you just identify the ways in which Jesus gave an example of being a humanist. And I probably wouldn't have used those words back then, but but I can easily see now that I was a Christian humanist. I I was a person who um, really took the life of my neighborhood and my community as seriously as I took the text of scripture. And, you know, when I saw someone who was homeless um, in my community and I thought, well, I feel an obligation, a call um, to in some way create a better world for not just my family, but for that person and, and many others as well. So and I, th- I think you can find examples. It's not univocal, but you can find examples in the in the New Testament of um, and even in the Old Testament of the prophets who condemned, uh, you know, unjust scales or you know dishonest business practices that hurt the poor and um, exploited them. Employers who would exploit their employees. There are you know there are admonitions in the prophets and in in the New Testament about these things, and I would just gravitate to those teachings. So you come out and you say. I just don't think there's enough evidence to convince me that there is a God. I don't really believe it anymore. And much of the response from professed Christians was pretty nasty. Were you surprised by the backlash? I suppose I shouldn't have been. Um, I, I was surprised, though. I think I, I, I guess I always a little naively think that Christians will in an effort to maybe be good Christians uh, or, or by being a good Christian, win me back in some way would, would use a different approach like compassion or, you know, win, win some speech, you know, um, identify with me in some way and, and then um, try to win me back. And, and many did do that, but, but some were just so vitriolic and I just tried to avoid those, uh, it was usually the, on those those things like the Charisma article that you referred to or some other Christian websites where, um, you know, it was the choir, you know, speaking to itself. It was really inside of its own bubble. And I don't really have time to take too much energy to spend on on those comments. It interests me, though. I mean, is this panic? I mean, what happens when one of our spiritual leaders, this guy was behind the pulpit, he's a representative, supposedly to a degree God's proxy on earth, and he comes forward and says, "Eh, it's probably a bunch of crap. I don't really see it. And they begin to panic. I mean, it's almost like you've insulted one of their children kind of thing. I mean, Mm. you, you see that is maybe part of what's going on there. They think, you know, wait, this is my faith. <laughs> so desperation kicks in or what? Yeah, I think the insult, the insult to your mother kind of example or your children is, is a good one. Like, you know, I can insult, I, I can criticize my mom, but you're not allowed to criticize my mom. Like that, that's off limits to all but me and my brother. Um, so I, there is some of that. And I also think it's deeply disturbing to Christians for a person to become an atheist and to do it in a calm, rational way. They're, they're looking for like, well, the guy must have had a psychotic break or he's harboring some secret sin or 
there's other some other kind of uh, moral ethical breakdown in his life or he's angry about something or somebody offended him or any one of these things and when you you know when you say like sure there are plenty of things to be uh, upset about the way that I, I was treated by the church and there's plenty of reason to be angry and frustrated but no more than any other person and and frankly it just that's not my motivation i still have good friends in the church i used to serve um and I still have, you know, my girlfriend's a Christian. I'm, you know, so all of these things are very troubling because it doesn't fit the narrative that Christians want to tell about Christians who become atheists. Um, but the more that a person is just a humanist, I mean, I work for a homeless service agency, you know, five days a week, I'm, you know, helping to end homelessness in Los Angeles. You know, I, I'm not a criminal. <laughs> I didn't try to murder someone as that other guy did. So, uh, these are all very like um, data points, you know, that are, are hard for people who are trying to say like, well, then how do we explain this transition in his life? And I'm, you know, I'm saying, it, 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 can you not conceive of the possibility that I just thought this through and it doesn't make sense to me anymore, but it's hard for them. I remember a time in my own apostasy or my own journey through these challenges. I mean, I couldn't sleep at night. I was my guts in a knot. I, I think this may impact the trajectory of the rest of my life. Did you have any of that? Did you have any? I I hate the word angst, <laughs> but did you yeah. literally sort of think, oh, my I mean, the implications of this are hardcore. This may change, literally change who I am and what I do for the rest of my life. Any of that happen with you? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it was relationships that might be lost, some that have been lost, um, career, income earning potential, um, family, my children. I mean, there's just so much on the line, so much at stake. Um, I mean, it would be easier for me to renounce my American citizenship and move to, you know, South Korea and just become as Korean as I could possibly be. That that seems more like at the time that I was going through it, that would seem easier almost, you know, to just uproot myself from my culture. So, yeah, it was a lot of uh, sleepless nights, a lot of those like, oh, shit, what have I done moments. Um you know, I just wrote this blog and said, I think I'm going to, you know, live as an atheist for a year, whatever that means, and try to understand the doubts and questions that I have. And then a few days later, I'm thinking, oh, this is not reversible. There's no reverse on this, is there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you, if I may, about family, and you tell me where the boundaries are. I'm not going to go anywhere that sure. you don't want to go, okay? Sure, Mother sure. and father, are they still alive? Yeah, definitely. Not married. They they were divorced when I was pretty young, but uh, mom lives. In What's Southern their Oregon. take? What's their take on all this? You know, we did some spent some time talking. Um, you know, it, for some of my family members, you know, my dad has had a hard time talking about it, and I've had a hard time talking to him about it. Uh, we've sort of done this standoff where I think, well, maybe he'll ask me if he wants to know, and then I keep thinking, well, maybe I should be the one to talk to him about it, and we just sort of avoid the topic and. Over Thanksgiving, we touched our toe into the water a little bit, but um, we have more to talk about. I think, you know, I think sometimes for parents, the temptation is either to lash out, which is not the way my parents w went, thankfully, but the alternative is, is occasionally like parents will blame themselves. They'll say, well, maybe I did something wrong or if I had been more this or that. And so I've just actually spent a bit of time just saying to my dad and to my mom, this is not your fault. Um, you did the best that you could do and that you did what you knew to be right and good for me. And I don't hold that against you just because I decided later on that it isn't true. Um, I don't have any hard feelings about that. My grandmother, who's still living, you know, she said, you know, I think God is is fine with your questions and he still holds you in his hand and I'm not worried about you at all because the God that I love, you know, loves you too. And, you know, so she just has this very sweet, warm, accepting Christianity where, you know, God's going to save me anyway. <laughs> hey, Ryan, do the seventh day Adventists, do they do hell? Do they believe in a literal hell of fire and no. brimstone or no? No, we, you know, I used to tell people for Adventists, hell is more of an event than a place. 
it's not a, a place where people go and suffer. Um, for, for Adventists, hell is a, a moment in time when the sort of those people who uh, stubbornly refuse God's mercy uh, are destroyed, but it's over and done with. It's not that they suffer and burn forever, and then the earth is cleansed by fire and recreated by God as this new new heaven and new earth, and the righteous, you know, those that God has saved will live forever in that paradise, but the, but the lost are just gone. And uh, theologically, it's sometimes referred to as annihilationism, that yeah. once the once the sinners are annihilated, they're they're no longer, they have no consciousness, they're not suffering, or they're not down in hell thinking, oh my God, I wish I could be with my loved ones, nothing like that. Well, at the very least, your folks aren't thinking about their son being tortured for all of eternity. I mean, that's a relief. Uh, right. Because many yeah, parents put sure. themselves through that. If only I had shown my child the love of Jesus even more, they would have escaped torment. And they've got these horrible sort of visions of fire and pain and just it's just a tragic to see what happens in this scenario one more question before i go to the uh, switchboard if i may your girlfriend yeah. wrote a blog or she posted something on facebook that you pasted into a blog what's that about yeah you know she's been walking with me this entire year um well i'm almost this entire year and she you know we met actually because I had known her sort of tangentially, just casually, uh, and we were friends on Facebook, and I posted my original blog post that started it all, and she wrote me a private message and said, you know, as a Christian, I think what you're doing is really great. Um, I think more people ought to take their faith and examine it in that way, and it surprised me, and we had talked about, hey, we should get coffee and, and meet up at some point, and we just never did. You know, you say that to some people, and it just seems like it never happened. And uh, she said, well, I said to her, well, maybe we ought to get that coffee we've been talking about. And so we did. And we we kind of hit it off and we just kept talking and um, hanging out and then we turned into dating. And she's, you know, it's been hard for her at times, I think, because it's sometimes hard to be kind. Like I've tried really hard to be gracious about all of this with people who still believe the last thing. I want is for my Christian friends to think I'm telling them that they're stupid for believing because that's what I think a lot of Christians receive that message from atheists, whether it's intended or not. Um, that no, often it is intended. <laughs> Trust me. Sometimes I mean, it's it's not, certainly not from all of us, but many of the most vocal among us love to play right. that card. You know, you're all idiots. Well, yeah, like the, right. And, and the analogy to Santa Claus just makes it's like, so I'm just this infantile, childish person who believes in Santa Claus. And, you know, I've been meaning to write this blog post all year long, sort of saying, like, I get what you're saying with the Santa Claus and Tooth Fairy analogy, but it's quite different than that for a believer. You know, it's not, the analogy only goes so far. So I've tried really hard to respect my Christian friends, many of whom have PhDs in theology. They're not conservatives. They're very progressive in their views, and their faith is much more evolved than, say, some um, some of the new Christians you read about in the news, uh, or like this guy who put up that 10 things to look for in a woman that you mentioned a minute ago. I just read that today and nearly vomited. It's you know, so terrifying. That's... Terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> that people well, would I... use this as a measuring stick for choosing a life partner. It's tragic. That, yeah, exactly. And my none of my Christian friends would, would they would go as 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 heavy as I would against against that that kind of talk. So I, I think, you know, what I've tried to do is be cautious. And my girlfriend has, has helped me. Anytime I try to get, or anytime I'm tempted to get too snarky or, or um, you know, lash out in a way that's a little generalizing, that's not fair to some Christians, she reminds me, not all Christians are that way. You need to be clear in what you're writing about, what you're exactly meaning. So it's been good. Well, what did she say in the blog? I mean, can you give me the Cliff's Notes version? What, what was she trying to communicate on your behalf? Oh, yeah. You know, she said, you know, that she um, that our relationship is about more than this topic. You know, that some people have said, how can you guys be in this relationship? And, you know, our, our sort of quick comeback on that is, well, we don't talk about year without God all the time. Like, we talk about other things. We have a life. We have jobs. We And then her funny comment was, you know, that, I'm the kind of guy who helps around the house and I do the dishes. And then she quips, Jesus doesn't do the dishes, you know, whether there's, you know, so, you know, whether there's a Jesus or not, somebody has got to do the dishes. And, 
And that's the basis for uh, our relationship. We share a passion for justice and goodness in the world. She's a humanist as much as I am. Um, she happens to believe in God. And even at that, she's sort of, a, I would call her a, a, a weak theist in Dawkins scale, kind of almost an agnostic. Ryan, if you have a few minutes, let's run to the switchboard and see what our callers have to bring to the conversation, okay? Let's do it. Area code 850. Thank you so much for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for calling the show. You're on with former pastor Ryan Bell. What do you have for us tonight? I actually have two questions for you guys. One is, what influenced you the most, do you think, to let go of theism? Would you say it's philosophy, history, or science? Yeah, that's a really, actually a really good question, and I've framed it almost exactly like that a few times. A lot of people leave theism because of science. Um, I would say that's almost the predominant one I hear about. Um, and for me, though, because I tended to be more of a philosopher in the beginning, um, I think a little bit more towards philosophy, but really I think my answer is history. This idea that God has shape-shifted throughout history depending on the culture and the needs of that group of people. You know, I'm, I'm really convinced by this sort of idea that we create gods uh, around our moral convictions to elevate them and enforce them and that sort of thing, rather than the other way around where God creates us. That's the whole notion is very convincing to me. That's very convincing to me, too, when I look at the different mythologies throughout history. Right. What was your second question? I have a passion for evolutionary theory, but I live in a place where it's predominantly creationist, and sometimes I'm not sure how to deal with it because there's so much beauty in evolution that they don't want to understand it. So um, do you have any advice for that? Hmm. Well, I wish I did, especially when it's culturally related to your where you live. You know, to me, this is one of the great tragedies of uh, a certain kind of theism. And I think that the real tragedy is that kids aren't getting a thorough education uh, in many cases. And, and I also just think that for a Christian or for a theist, uh, evolution isn't intuitive. It's not. Uh, it's almost in some ways counterintuitive. You know, the whole like, well, if you, you know, if an auto plant exploded, you wouldn't expect the pieces to come down in the form of a Dodge Viper, you know, it just <laughs> it would be a big pile of mess. And of course, that's true. Uh, so, but it's these appeals to sort of logic in this sort of traditional way. And, and this is what leads evolutionary theorists and scientists to say, but this is the whole point of Darwinism. He showed us that this counterintuitive thing is actually what's happening. So, uh, you know, I don't know how we go about trying to persuade people who don't want to consider that evidence or see it for what it is. I think over time, though, it will shift. And I know that calls for an uncomfortable amount of patience, but I think we're probably dealing yeah. with the emotional response. It sort of goes against our specialness. We are no longer a hand created, hand picked, adopted child of the creator of the entire universe with eternal life waiting in a mansion in the stars and streets of gold and pearly gates. All of these fairy tales that we sort of have created speak to our specialness in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And if you see us as evolved creatures, it's very difficult, I think, for us to see ourselves as, I, I don't want to say we're not important. I mean, I think we create important in our own life, but it's it's very sobering in many ways to realize the universe does not care if we exist. And I think that's a hurdle we have to get over if we're going to educate people about what evolution is and isn't. Ryan, did you understand the basics of evolution when you were growing up in a Christian culture? No, I really didn't growing up. I mean, I remember, and I've said this a couple of times before, I remember watching like a National Geographic special with my family and you know, the narrator would say, make some reference to millions of years ago. And, and I can distinctly remember on multiple occasions thinking to myself, 
well, that's not true. We all know that, you know, and, and it's just, it was so obviously wrong to me. I didn't even think about it. And it, the, what's weird is I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me or, 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 or trouble me that these really, really smart scientists all had it wrong. Like that didn't, you'd, you'd think that you'd say like, well, here I am a 14 year old kid and I think I'm smarter than all these guys who and gals who've been studying this for years. Um, later in life, I did come to the point where I thought, okay, this doesn't make sense. And then I said, well, Genesis clearly is not a literal account, especially seeing as how there are two different ones, uh, in Genesis one and two of how the earth came to be. So perhaps they're both compatible. And I lived in that world for a while. I think it also has to do with how we explain evolution, because, um, have you guys heard of the paleontologist Neil Shubin, he wrote Your Inner Fish, and he explains evolution beautifully. He basically gives you the idea of the family tree of life and that you can take any two species and compare their DNA to see what common ancestor they had and when they had it. So it could be best to put an idea like that out there. Evolution is basically just how species relate and the common ancestry that they share. At the time of this broadcast, Your Inner Fish is actually available. I think it's what five or six episodes. It's available on Netflix. So if you have a Netflix account, uh, you can find it and just watch it. It's, I think, on their new releases section. I just happened to see it a few days ago. I haven't seen it myself, but it has become highly recommended. People say it is really, really well done. So we'll have to scope that out. For sure. I'd love to see it. Thank you so much for the call. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say in follow up as as we move to the next one, I thought, you know, your point about it it really rocks the narrative, you know, because if evolution is true, then there's not original sin. We weren't pristine and perfect in a garden and we didn't fall from grace. And so the whole thing begins to unravel from the very beginning. Well, many of us feel that way about those who don't take a literal Genesis account. Once you get rid of Adam, Eve, the forbidden fruit, the fall, the removal from the garden, the tainting of humankind and billions of people, there's no original sin, no need for redemption from original sin. There's no flooding of the world because we haven't been corrupted. There's no Jesus. I mean, the rest of the biblical narrative really begins to fall apart once you reject a literal book of Genesis. And I'm surprised more people in the church haven't latched on to that as they sort of walk away from fundamentalism. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Thank you so much for the call. Greatly appreciated. One more thing. I do find a contradiction in what they say when they tell us that humans are above other beings. And then they say, you're not allowed to be human, basically. You're not allowed to have sex or have different thoughts. So it's contradictory. I see that contradiction, too. Like, we are, you know, this beautiful creation. God doesn't make mistakes, you know. But the first thing you learn as a Christian is all the things that you have to avoid that are part of your natural being. And so, I mean, I think my experience with gay and lesbian Christians in my own congregation presented that contradiction pretty starkly where, you know, you know, God is perfect and God creates, you know, beautiful things, except for unless you're gay, then you're not allowed to be that way. Hey, thanks for calling the show. Greatly appreciated. You're welcome. Area code 407. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, this is Jeffrey from Orlando. Thanks for calling, Jeffrey. What's going on? Not much. I just had a quick question for both of you guys, actually. Now, I know you both have probably had this asked multiple times over your careers, which was, um, you know, how you got away from religion and became secular. But now let me just put this out there. I'm not in any way, shape or form trying to reconvert you. I'm just a genuinely curious atheist. But what would you say is some sort of either event or grasp of knowledge or some sign of proof would bring you back to religion, like, because I've had people come up to my door proclaiming to know the truth. They'll say, oh, you're going to go back to religion in the end. But what would you guys say would bring you guys back? Ryan? (laughs) I was going to throw it to you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, That's a really, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think think about it for a second. Yeah, no, yeah, you go for it. (laughs) Well, I remember... 
When I saw Ken Ham and Bill Nye debating last year at the Creation Museum, and they ask, and what many people don't know about the one of the final questions from the audience is that it actually came from a member of the Thinking Atheist community. And here's the story, just in a nutshell. A young lady sent me an email and she said, I have tickets to the debate. I'll be in the audience. And they're asking us to submit questions, to prepare questions. I think I want to submit a question, but I don't know what to ask. What would you ask? And I responded and I said, well, what I would ask is, what would it take to get you to change your position? And that was one of the questions that was selected from the audience and was asked to both Ken Ham and Bill Nye. Ken Ham essentially declared there's nothing that would ever make him reject God or change his mind. He's set in stone, period. Bill, in a very relaxed delivery, just said, one piece of evidence is all it would take for me to change my position. And that is exactly how I feel. If Jesus shows up tomorrow, when I tell this to religious family members and friends to assure them, if Jesus shows up tomorrow, if Thor or Wotan shows up tomorrow, if a deity of any brand or caliber or form shows up, I will evaluate it based on its merits and we'll figure that out. Whatever is true, that's what I want to do. It's not that I woke up one day and said, today, I want to be an atheist. Tomorrow, I want to be an atheist. It's I just want to live a truthful life. And I, like Ryan, have put the puzzle pieces together and there's no God there. There's just no evidence for it. And if the evidence appears in five minutes, we're going to reevaluate that evidence and we will go that direction and see where that takes us. And if new evidence appears the day after that, we'll go that direction. Wherever the evidence leads us is where we're going to go. That's how I would respond. How'd I do, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think that's that's right. And I, and it's not just any piece of evidence either. Like I, my friend the other day said, um, my, you know, my friend, actually, it was just last night, I was talking to my friend Bart Campolo, and he said just one, one regrown limb on an amputee would that would do it for him. And I thought that's, that would be pretty compelling. That, that would be, pr I would definitely have to, especially if it was verifiable and all of that, you, that would be pretty, pretty convincing. I'm also, um, I'm not a huge science fiction nerd, but I do love a good science fiction story, especially if it, it's as close as possible to science and less fiction. Um, so I'm always thinking like, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, Shermer's last law that, you know, if we encountered a, a more intelligent species um, out in the universe, um, th that, that species would appear godlike to us. Um, anything more intelligent than us by a, you know, a fairly large leap would seem godlike to us. And, you know, if we, through some scientific discovery, um, came across uh, an intelligent life form, uh, that created us uh, in some fashion, then yeah, I mean that that would seem that would if, that, if there was evidence for that, then then that would be like Prometheus. You know, you you go out and you find these engineers who built us or something like that. Then we would have to accept that. Um, I don't know if it would be God or not. I was going to say I definitely want to speak to them about their whole design on the human race because there could be a few tweaks that could be done. <laughs> Yeah, and they would probably admit that too. They they would probably say, "Well, we we're doing the best we can, man. We were like in fourth grade science class, you know. What do you, what do you expect?" Why do um, I have nipples? That's what I yeah. want to know. What are these yeah. for? I I don't. <laughs> never mind. That's a whole other. I broadcast. think it's just right. I just think it's uh, symmetry. You know, it's just symmetry. <laughs> <laughs> do you think there's life out there? Like I myself and the romantic in me thinks. As vast as the universe is, and as much as we don't know, I think there's life in some form somewhere, probably in a way that we couldn't even conceive of, something we haven't even thought of yet. I, sure. I just think, yeah, there's something out there. What do you think? I think so. Like, I think that, that I like to think so, at least, you know, and it doesn't change my life, whether there is or there isn't. Um, but I think human beings love to think so. We make a lot of movies about that stuff, you know? <laughs> And yes. uh, there's a lot of fear around it. Um, but, but yeah, I think that the universe that created, if we can use that word, um, our planet and all of us over a long, long period of time certainly could have created or produced some other uh, life form, um, whether it's intelligent or how intelligent, you know, who knows. Um, but yeah, like I think 
uh, that can, that search goes on and I'm certainly open to the idea that we're not completely alone in the universe and that there's more going on out there and that there's some kind of thing that's, I mean, I, I tell people that what's apparent to me is that we are more than the sum of our parts. Um, and, and I think we would, you know, roughly think of that as consciousness. You know, we're not, uh, we're not plants. We're not even cats. We're something more than that, you know? And, and that something more, I think creates in this, in, in people, this, desire to connect it to something divine outside of us because we can't search it, you know, inside of ourselves. And that, I think that keeps us looking for, uh, you know, what might be out beyond us that may have made, made their mark on us. But you know, until that time that we find that, I'm certainly content being just who I am. I've actually heard that as an argument by an apologist. I mean, if we're evolved, why us? Why did it stop with us? And of course, the whole time I'm thinking, stop. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. our, you know, we're talking about billions of years. Who knows what life will look like? You know, if, if the big asteroid hasn't impacted the planet by then, I'd be curious to see what life looks like on this planet. Anything else before I move on, sir? No, I think that was about it. Thank you so much for calling the broadcast. Greatly appreciate it. All right. Thank you. So you enjoy sci-fi. Did you go see uh, Interstellar? Did you go check it out? I did. Huh? Yeah, I loved it. You know, it's a, it's a mind bender for me. I'm not a physicist. <laughs> so, um, but I loved reading some of the articles afterwards, too, um, from the, the Caltech uh, astrophysicist who was the consultant on the project. And I, I like what I love. Arthur C. Clarke was this kind of writer. Uh, Orson Scott Card, to a degree, is this kind of... Um, of writer that their science fiction hues as close to science as they can. Um, they're not making huge leaps of logic, but just stretching what we know into what we, what might be possible. I just, I think it's fascinating. I don't know much about the science, you know, when they get into relativity and how a half an hour is seven years. And I, I began to really feel my left eye start to twitch, but it was still awesome, right? <laughs> but it was funny to watch the scientific community come out. Some people are like, the physics of this is crap. This is crap. This is crap. But then Neil deGrasse Tyson comes out and says, hey, this was awesome. You know, this yeah. was, it was a pro-science film. It, it got a lot of things right. He really took an optimistic view about it, which I thought was cool. I had a great time. I mean, it's, you know, it's a three-hour film. <laughs> so pack a lunch, yeah. kids. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the misnomers about science in the Christian community, at least one that I had embraced, was that science is about reductionism. It's about reducing all this beauty and telling you it's all just atoms. It's all just, you know, uh, molecules. There's, you know, and it takes all the beauty out of it. But what I've discovered this last year is that it's really quite the opposite. One of the things that fuels new scientific discoveries is this wonderful curiosity about things. And in order to fuel that curiosity, you've got to, you probably, scientists have to propose some pretty outlandish things. And probably 90% of the things that they propose are wrong. But in order to get to the thing that's right, they have to consider the thing that's kind of out there. Otherwise, you're never stretching beyond what you already know. So I think imagination plays an enormous role in the scientific process. And I just don't think that's well enough known among Christians who think, oh, scientists are just trying to tear down the mystery of the world and make it all explainable. It's just not how it is. What does somebody with a doctor of ministry and missional leadership do when someone is no longer doing pastoral work? It's not a degree that you can necessarily apply to a whole lot of other things outside the church. Did you find that a challenge, Ryan? Oh, it was a challenge. And and some of it is actually a challenge, and some, some of it is perceptional, you know? Like, so people have a perception that a pastor might not be very good at much of anything else. Um, in fact, pastors have leadership skills, um, business administration to a certain degree, uh, community organizing, community building, public speaking, um, counseling. So there's a variety of skills. The problem with being a pastor is that you're, um, you know, you're a specialist at anything. You're a generalist. And, and so you can do a little of this and a little of that, but not, you're not a professional counselor. So you could never really get a job as a counselor. 
Um, you're not a professional business leader, so no one's really going to take you seriously that you can run a business, even though you've been running a small nonprofit for however long. Um, and my degree was in leadership, so there are a lot of transferable principles, but the fact that it comes from a religious school with a religious subtext makes it difficult for that degree to be applicable in most people's eyes. I think that's why uh, the clergy project is so important, because it does help people pivot out of religious life into something else. Sounds like you're helping homeless people. I mean, what's that about? What are you doing? Well, I work in the development department, which has three major components. There's the development part, which is fundraising and um, financial support for the organization. But then I work in community engagement, which is all of our relationships with the outside community, so government, other nonprofits, the faith community, neighborhood coalitions, hospitals, any other agency or organization that's that's not us, that has some relationship to the question of homelessness, um, we interface with them and um, build relationships with them. So that's my work. And it involves volunteers, managing volunteers, and ironically, working with the faith community, which is a huge support to the work that we do in, in ending homelessness. It surprises a lot of people that there are religious people who listen to this broadcast. You know, some of them are curious about what the devil's up to, <laughs> you know, right. and uh, some people are going through a journey. They've got questions. They're genuinely curious. So, all right, I'm Seth Andrews. I used to sit in your congregation, Ryan, and I'm going through some questions and challenges and things are beginning to not make sense. And I'm listening to this broadcast now, listening to the sound of your voice. What would you say to somebody who was beginning to go down the path that you began years ago, what would you say to encourage them at this measure? You know, I would just say that truth um, can stand on its own two feet, uh, that truth doesn't need to be defended in the way that sometimes we think it does. And, um, you know, I've said to some of my Christian colleagues and friends recently, if, if you're right and the Bible is true and all of this is explainable, then, you know, it shouldn't worry you to question it and look into it and study it. Um, and, and if you're not right, wouldn't you want to know that? Like, wouldn't you want to know um, what the truth is? And I think this is how many of us that were trained to be pastors lived our lives, too. We, we, I could picture myself going into the home of a Catholic person, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm saying, if Catholicism is right, then you have no problem. You'll be able to defend yourself. You'll be able to explain why you believe what you believe. But if I'm right, wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to know that? Wouldn't you want to, like, explore further? So I, what surprises me is that Christians get fearful of, these, of engaging in these questions. Um, when I think that if you have the truth, then you should be willing to open it to scrutiny. And if under that scrutiny it doesn't hold up, then it may not be a pleasant truth. You know, it might be an uncomfortable truth. But it still would be more truth than what you had before, and I'm just, a, I'm maybe not everybody's wired this way, but I'm just the person that I want to follow the truth wherever it goes. And that went, that was true when I was a Christian and it's a true now. It's true now. Um, I wanted to follow the evidence and the, um, the truth wherever it led me. And this is where it's led me. And I think anybody out there that's questioning, don't let anybody make you afraid of asking an important question or shame you um, as a way of getting you to stop asking particular questions about science or evolution or history or ethics or anything else, the Bible. Uh, if you have a question, ask it and go around finding the answer until you find it to your satisfaction. And if you're still a Christian at the end of that, then that's, that's great. At least you'll have an examined faith and you'll be able to stand strongly in it and be a good person. Um, I just, I just think that's, that's the only way that I know how to approach all of this. Ryan, how do people follow your work? Where's your blog? Uh, my blog is at www.yearwithoutgod.com. I haven't been writing there as much during this last little stretch of uh, media craziness, but I'm going to continue to write my blog there. Um, there's also a documentary that a couple of guys have decided to make and they followed me around throughout the year. We're just about to wrap up photography on that and they can find people can find about the documentary at 
www.yearwithoutgodfilm.com. There's a really nice teaser there. You can sign up for our mailing list. We're going to be launching an Indiegogo campaign in the next few days to fund the the post-production portion of that, the editing and so forth. So uh, we could really use any amount of help to get that done. Um, so that that's where people can find those, those two things. That's pretty much uh, the main focus right now. One thing about having a former pastor as a guest is I never have to worry if they're a good communicator. Now, can they tell a story? <laughs> can they express themselves? With former pastors, you just never have to worry about it. You just let them go. You know, I sit back and drink my hot tea and let you do your thing. And it's all, already a fantastic <laughs> broadcast. Ryan Bell, for your time and for sharing your story with the rest of us, thank you so much. And thank you for being a part of tonight's show. It means a tremendous amount to all of us. Appreciate it. Thank you for what you're doing. I know this show has been invaluable to thousands, thousands of people, including me. And so I just, just uh, right back to you. Thank you for what you're doing. All right, Ryan, we'll be in touch and we'll be following your journey and your blog and the documentary coming soon. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Tonight's broadcast has been brought to you by Nature Box. Now that the show is over, check out the website. Get your free sampler box of great tasting and healthy, wholesome snacks. Stuff like toasted sesame sticks. Go to naturebox.com slash Thinking Atheist, naturebox.com slash Thinking Atheist. See you back here Thursday night as we do a show called In the Wake of Charlie Hebdo. I will see you then. Take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. Thethinkingatheist.com.